Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 4th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our view of Governor Dunleavy's proposed constitutional amendments. Good on the objectives, but the language needs a lot of work. Second, a Twitter exchange reveals a critical disconnect that's going on in the PFD debate. This isn't about saving state spending through PFD cuts. It's about whether PFD cuts are the best way to raise revenue. They aren't. And in fact, ICER has said PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and families of all of the options. And third, what Governor Denleavy's proposed supplemental budget rollback tells us about the coming Alaska legislative budget battles. In our view, part of it is about increasing local responsibility. And now, let's join Michael. Uh, let's crack things open then. Let's start talking about uh, your weekly top three. We start off with number one, which is the proposed constitutional amendments from Governor Dunleavy. Uh, we start out with the these constitutional amendments that just strip the power from the legislature and give them to the governor, or so says some of the headlines. So let's uh, let's see what your take is. So three proposed amendments: one to constitutionalize the PFD, uh, the second to limit spending, uh, and the third to require that uh, any taxes, uh, any state taxes, and it's and and that's all it says: state taxes. So it's very broadly. Uh, very broadly applied, uh, have to go to uh, a vote of the people before uh, before they can be adopted. Um, all three, uh, consistent with what the governor talked about uh, during the campaign, uh, all three uh, very, uh, the objectives of all three, uh, is something that, uh, that we agree with. Uh, the problem, but there are problems, and the problems come in how each uh, uh, amendment is written. The constitutional amendment for the PFD, for example, um, uh, would constitutionalize the current calcul the calculation uh, of the that's currently in statute of the PFD. As we've talked about on previous shows, there's a problem with that. Uh, once government starts taking its 50 percent, the way inflation proofing works, uh, it isn't a 50-50 split between government. Uh, it's it's uh, 50 percent percent of earnings to uh, the PFD, but only 25 percent to government. The other 25 percent goes to inflation proofing. And as, as I've said on the show and in previous pieces, I don't think that's what Governor Hammond intended. I think Governor Hammond intended after inflation proofing that 50 percent go to the PFD and 50 percent to government. So right. there's a problem. There's a problem with that amendment that needs to be worked on. There's a problem with the with the spending cap. Uh, and, just to, and just to clarify, Brad, that would then spread the inflation proving across both sectors, both the private and the government sector. That's that's the intent of what you're saying here. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, it's okay. not it's not to cut the PFD. It's just to get it to work right. Right. So that there is 50 percent of the PFD and 50 percent to government. Right. Um, once we got there or after inflation proofing. Right. Uh, the Second Amendment is to impose a spending cap. Uh, and again, a very good, a very good objective, but again, a problem in in the details. Uh, Governor Dunleavy said in the State of the State address very directly and very accurately that uh, spending shouldn't be any more than revenues. But when you look at the constitutional amendment that the administration's proposed, uh, it doesn't it doesn't tie the spending cap to revenues. The word revenues isn't even in. Uh, the proposed constitution, constitutional amendment. Instead, it just takes the current status quo 
uh, in terms of spending and escalates it and escalates the spending cap based upon based upon that base. So it and and so if revenues went way down uh, again, if we had another drop down to forty dollar oil prices or if oil production uh, fell way down, uh, it would the the spending cap wouldn't follow it because it's not tied to revenues. So again, a very laudable objective, but uh, not uh, one that's that's really implemented well in the language they proposed. The third one. Uh, on taxes, sort of the same problem. I mean, it's a very laudable objective to make sure that taxes have to go before the people. Uh, but the problem with that one is it's not tied uh, to spending. So you you have tax caps in order to limit spending. Right. Here, because we have a whole bunch uh, of money saved in fiscal reserves, a tax cap wouldn't uh, wouldn't effectively tie the legislature's hands on spending. They could continue spending. Uh, by going to the by going to the fiscal reserves. So it, it, again, another laudable objective, but um, falls short um, in the in the details. The the, uh, the the it seems like that the main thread through this whole thing is the spending. I mean, the revenue and the spending that seems to be the missing component of all these. Yeah, you you need to tie you need to tie the the, the second and the third the tax cap and the spending cap need to be tied together. They don't need to be two in two separate men, amendments. I mean, you could have you could you could have the tax cap pass and not the and not the spending cap pass. I mean, there's all sorts of of disconnects that be that can be created. So those need to be two those two need to be tied in in one amendment and 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 spending needs to be limited to revenues and revenues need to be limited uh, by the tax cap. And then the first one, uh, if we're going to constitutionalize the PFD, as we should, uh, we, we need to get it correct in terms of how inflation proofing works, take inflation proofing from both sides before we do it. All three laudable objectives, all three um, uh, things we ought to do, but, but the details of how we do them uh, need to be worked on. I, frankly, I, the, the, I think there's going to be a lot of activity, should be a lot of activity, in Senator Mike Shower's state uh, state affairs committee, which is the first committee on the Senate side, at least since the Senate's functioning, the first committee that will be that will be hearing these bills or hearing these proposals, and I think it's going to be up to Senator Shower in state affairs and then uh, Senator Hughes in uh, in Senate Judiciary to sort of get these um, uh, amendments uh, written in a way that achieve their objectives before they get to Senate finance so that once we get to Senate finance, we're arguing about the pur pure policy of whether we have these amendments or we don't, we're not still arguing about the details of the amendments. Right. Right. Well, the devil is always in the, there's some, some quote somewhere I heard one time about, you know, essentially hell being a, a committee where they have to put these things together because what you start off with is some kind of bastardized stepchild. A lot of times when it comes out the other side, so the point here is to try and protect the intent of the amendment and streamline it and make it more efficient and better and more able to pass because we're talking about uh, I mean you got to have uh, you got to have 2 thirds of both houses of the legislature pass it and then go to a vote of the people on top of that so this is a pretty high bar when it's all said and done It is uh, and and it's and it's a this is an effort that that's important to make. It's important to try to get these things constitutionalized. I mean, we've seen over the last seven years as we've drawn down $20 billion in fiscal reserves, we've seen what happens if the legislature doesn't have constraints on its on its actions. I mean, those people who say, well, this is going to be, this is going to put too many side rails on the legislature. Well, we've seen a legislature unside railed uh, over the last seven years, and it's, and it's, and it's not pretty. On $20 billion in reserves, we have Essentially, done deficits. Uh, when you look at the last seven years in total, deficit spending has been a third of that. Two third, we funded two thirds of the budget, but actually more than a third uh, has been funded by pulling down fiscal reserves. So, um, the legislature—you can't trust the legislature, basically. Right. Uh, on, on these areas, you need to put sideboards on it. These are good sideboards. We just need to get the language right 
uh, before we before we constitutionalize these things. Because at the heart of this, and I want to come back to this because there's been some comments in the chat room this morning about you know uh, spending too much and everything. The heart of this is is a spending problem. I mean, I think you and I have had this discussion for four years essentially. We're not really facing a revenue problem in this state so much as the appetite for spending in state government is is and has been out of control for years. Yep. It, it, I, I mean, I wrote a piece in 2012 uh, when people were still going to the legislature and say, uh, oh, AstroTurf our football fields, build us new football stadiums at all the Alaska high, at all of the Anchorage high schools, uh, build us a, a, a new buildings on the UAA campus, two new engineering buildings. I wrote a piece in 2012. You could see it coming then. If you use Scott Goldsmith's analysis, you could see it coming then that we were spending too much. And I wrote a piece that in the in the October uh, during the October fr- time frame of 2012, leading up to the 2012 election, saying uh, uh, we need to we need to get this under control. And people, I re- I recall people coming up to me and saying, "Oh, there's no problem. You know, when we get to this, the legislature will do the right thing." Um, and they didn't. They haven't. Yeah. Uh, and and we've just spiraled out of control. You can see it then. We've spiraled out of control uh, uh, since that time. There is a spending problem. So. We, we need to get these constraints on the legislature, um, but, but it needs to be done right. If we constitutionalize the PFD as the administration proposed it, we'd just be spiraling, spiraling ourselves into the, into the next problem because basically two-thirds of the earnings would go to the PFD, only a third would go to government. It would, it would short fund government relative to where Governor Hammond intended to put it, um, and, we, and, we, and that would just lead us directly into a tax situation. So. Uh, or a greater tax situation. So right. we need to get these things right. Harold has got heartburn with you, Brad. Just saying, you're just you're just an oil company shill. We all know that. Uh, you have. <laughs> yeah. I just I just, you know, I, just I, don't know. I love Harold to death, but that's that that makes me laugh actually. He's got to have some bogeyman every day. I know, I know, but I mean, you know, Harold's always got good information. I will say that he's always given me some good scoop and intel on different things from the inside and a different perspective. But, uh, but that's one thing that he and I definitely disagree on. I mean, <clears throat> first of all, you have you have uttered the heresy of heresies and said there's still wiggle room in the oil taxes to uh, maximize the returns to the state of Alaska. Not I mean, not going in there with an axe or anything, but there are a few things that could be done to make the returns maximize for the – I mean, I think you've been disinvited from all the oil company parties from now on just for that comment alone. Well, and, I got disinvited with HB 331. Well, that's then, true, too. Yeah, that's true, too. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> Setting that whole thing aside, when you said, no, we're not going to give that billion dollars to them, Brad stopped. He didn't get any more Christmas cards after that. <laughs> no Christmas candy. No, no. Yeah. No. I, I mean, the oil company. Look, we need oil company investment in this state. That's that's what our state finances are built on. That's what a large segment of our of our private industry is built on. And we've got to be smart about how we set our fiscal uh, uh, things, uh, our fiscal uh, uh, standards uh, in dealing with the oil companies. That doesn't mean from time to time there isn't there, that the oil companies don't overreach, and I certainly try to call them out uh, when they do. HB 331 is a, is a, is a great example of that. Uh, but we need oil company investment, and we need to be smart about it. And, you know, some people want to say, well, the oil companies are just really another piggy bank. They're just another fiscal reserve, and we need a you know we need a few more billion dollars. We just dig down uh, and go after them. Well, oil companies have choices. I mean, they can, they, with respect to new investment, they can invest new dollars here, there, there they can invest new dollars someplace else. And from 2007 to 2013, basically, we saw them investing someplace else, and we saw Alaska production, the investment in Alaska relative to the rest of the world, uh, and Alaska production uh, on decline. So. We need to understand how to attract oil companies here. That doesn't mean that we need to we need to overcompensate them like HB three thirty one would right. would have done. But but we need the oil companies here, and we need to we need to be smart about how we set our fiscals in order to <clears throat> achieve that. And I think Damien in the chat room also misunderstood what you were. I mean, he was saying that you're trying to twist Mike Dunleavy's words on these amendments and everything. You support these constitutional amendments. You're just saying that the language in them needs to be clear. I mean, you and I have talked about supporting these type of amendments for the last three years. And, I mean, you just want the wording to be correct with the intent of what they're trying to do. Yeah, we need to, we need to, achieve, we need to achieve the objectives. And, and, I mean, 
this the amendment the amendment on the spending cap is the clearest example. Dunleavy himself has said we 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 need to tie revenues and spending. We need to be spending no more than we have in revenues. Well, the spending cap doesn't mention revenues at all. It doesn't tie spending to revenues. It ties it to some artificial baseline that then sort of escalates off uh, into into the future uh, without being without any relation to revenue. So we just need to get back to what the intent of these amendments are. Get them well written. That's what Mike Shower's committee is for. Get them well written, uh, and then and then go forward and, and implement them. Right. Which was the problem with this. Which is the problem with the cap that's already in the Constitution is that it's you know it's fa- it's tied to some baseline figure that never really worked appropriately for reducing the ability of the legislature to spend beyond their means. It just was it, it was never effective, and so we've yep. already made that mistake once. We don't want to repeat. Yeah, it's an easy. I can see how how the 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 attorney general's office or revenue or wrote it. I mean, it's just it's an easy way to write it, but it doesn't achieve the objective. It doesn't tie spending to revenues, uh, and so you've got to you've got you've got to write it correctly in order to achieve what we want, right? Or else or else we're wasting all this effort. Same way with the PFD. We need to write the PFD uh, constitutional amendment in a way that reflects. Governor Hammond's original purpose, 50 percent of earnings uh, to, to PFD, 50 percent to citizens. That's not the way the way it's written. It's not the way it works. Right. Uh, and, and so we just need to get in and we just need to make sure these things achieve the objectives that Governor Dunleavy's laid out. Brad, 45 seconds here. Your thoughts on Knopf's latest move uh, to vote against Tallarico again and try and broker this deal quickly. <laughs> to say that I, I, I'm going to vote for him someday, but I'm not going to vote for him now. I, right. Tammy, Tammy's got this nailed. Your conversation yesterday with her about there being a, a, an underlying objective to, to sort of wreck the ship so that Dunleavy can't, there's not time left for Dunleavy to come in with these, uh, for the legislature to adopt Dunleavy's budget cuts. I, I think that's absolutely correct. And I think Kanop is, is sort of captaining that ship to run it, run it into the shoal. Returning now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. One final segment for this hour. The fastest two hours in radio. Don't you ever doubt that for a moment. Uh, we're continuing now with his weekly top three. And uh, we're discussing uh, number two and three in succession. Brad, number two is the foreshadowing on where the PFD debate is going already. You had a Twitter exchange with the one of the members of the Fairbanks Daily News Minor editorial board after they said, we do not need the PFD enshrined in the Constitution. Uh, and I think it really showed their hands as to you know what most uh, folks in that kind of area's thought process is on whose money that is. Yeah, the, so, so the, this whole Twitter debate is about uh, is is about the mindset that the only way we're going to save uh, uh, K through 12 spending, university spending, which is really on the minds of a lot of people in Fairbanks, um, uh, and and other pots of spending, the only way we're going to save that is to make sure uh, that we keep the PFD around so we can cut the PFD and use that money, uh, use that money to help fund the, those parts of, of government. And, and they say uh, there's an ICER analysis that says that it hurts the state more economically to, uh, to cut spending, government spending, than it, is, than it does to cut the PFD. So they try to make this a whole debate about PFD versus government spending and, and try to isolate it on the PFD, it, isolate it uh, in that frame. That's, that's, the wrong, that's the wrong mindset to me. What the ICER analysis really says is the PFD is the worst way to create additional revenue for the government. It has the largest of all the options for creating additional revenue for the government. It has the largest adverse impact uh, on the overall Alaska economy. It's by far uh, the, the costliest, the most, uh, most negative impact uh, on Alaska families. And the debate really isn't about the PFD versus government spending. Right. The debate is really about the PFD versus other ways of raising revenue, um, and the PFD is the worst way to do it. So, if we have to raise additional revenue, the the real debate here is is if we have to raise additional revenue, what's the best way to do it? And the PFD, we know the PFD is the worst. That's what the ICER analysis says. What are, what are other ways? Well, one way is a flat tax that you and I have talked about uh, on the show. Another way, I, it, it it's not my preferred way. But another way is a sales tax. Sales tax is regressive like a 
like the PFD cut, it hurts the middle income and lower income classes. Uh, income classes more than it hurts the upper income class. Uh, but that's another way to do it. Another way is a progressive income tax. But that's it's not it's not a debate. PF, the PFD isn't the only way to fund government. It isn't the only way to keep the university funded. It isn't the only way to keep K through 12 funded. Uh, there are other ways to do it. Uh, and the PFD is the worst of those other ways to do it. So if we're going to be talking about increased revenue, uh, we shouldn't be talking about the PFD. We ought to take that off the table. We should be talking about things like the flat tax uh, and whether that's the right way to fund additional spending. Now, of course, right. of course, people in the chat room are probably already going. Well, I was just going to say, for all those people at home who are screaming at their radio right now about, what are you talking about? Neither Brad or I are in favor of more revenue. But if the conversation is going to go there, and folks, we've been losing this battle for years. We've been having this battle over, do we have a spending problem and a revenue problem? And the powers that be have framed this as a revenue problem every time. And so it, it is, I mean, yes, we ought to cut spending. We need to cut spending. We need to, we need to have these constitutional amendments that impose a spending cap and, and tie taxes uh, to spending. We ought to, we ought to do all of that. But as you just said, Michael, we've been losing this battle for the last seven years. We have funded a third of our budget over $20 billion or $20 billion over a third of our budget through, through deficit financing, through drawing down fiscal reserves. And if you listen to Tammy and you listen to others, it it is unlikely we're going to make the budget cuts this year. Highly unlikely we're going to make the budget cuts this year uh, to get spending uh, in line with revenue. We're going to need uh, additional revenues. We're going to have additional deficits. We've used up our our fiscal reserves. So the question is, the question really is, when you get to the PFD, is how are we going to raise those additional revenues? And cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact. Uh, on the overall aspect of the Alaska. I, I take, when, when somebody says we need, to keep, we need to keep the PFD on the table because we need to cut it to fund government, uh, fund additional government, I, that's just the wrong way of, of thinking about it. There are other options to fund government, flat tax, sales tax, progressive income taxes, oil taxes. I mean, I, to, to, to give Harold his due, there are adjustments we can make to oil taxes. We need to keep those on the table. We need not to be focusing uh, just solely on PFD versus, versus government spending. There are other options, uh, and those other options have a lower impact on the overall Alaska economy, have a lower impact uh, on Alaska citizens uh, than cutting the PFD. So that's number two, PFD. Again, we know this is going to be the largest battle that we're going to face when this is all said and done. Uh, I think that that is already showing its uh, it's showing its colors. This goes back to the story that I was talking about before we brought you on the air, that there are people within the administration, even bureaucrats within the administration, who are already you know, rubbing their hands together and have their sights set on taking the PFD. Uh, and people want to say it's not a tax, but we are already being taxed by the taking of that PFD. And, and there's one more thing to be said about that, Michael. The people who really want this to be a debate about the PFD versus government spending is the top 20%. They want to keep the focus on the PFD because by far that the cutting the PFD affects them the least. Right. It pushes the bulk of, of responsibility for government spending to middle and lower income Alaskans. They're the ones that want to keep the focus on the PFD. They're the ones that want to avoid talking about flat taxes, sales taxes, progressive income taxes and oil taxes. Um, and, 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 and to the extent people in the middle and lower income brackets buy off on that and say, oh, well, we can't talk about, you know, we can't talk about those other options. Um, uh, we're putting, we're, we're putting ourselves in a, in a, in a horrible situation by just letting PF, the PFD be the only thing left on the table uh, about new, about uh, additional revenues. We need to be having a discussion about these other options and then comparing it to the PFD and realizing the PFD is the worst uh, for the overall Alaska economy and for Alaska families of all those options. Let's move on to number three. What the uh, release by the governor of the supplemental budget, what that does, and it, and it includes, of course, this $20 billion uh, clawback uh, into, uh, into the budgets to help pay for some of the mitigation of the earthquakes, and the fervor and the hand-wringing that immediately ensued over that, what does it tell us about the coming battles in the legislature? <laughs> 
Well, I think I think you had it exactly right in the conversation with Tammy yesterday that that twenty billion dollar or that twenty million dollar cut is just really a shot across the bow. It is it is a way of saying not only it, it's a way of saying there are going to be big cuts coming and we're going to foreshadow those with this with this twenty million dollar cut and the pushback that we're getting from legislators and others uh, is is also sort of a shot across the bow. It's saying, basically it's saying, hey, you're not going to cut anything. Uh, if you can't even cut $20 billion, uh, we're going to push back and you're not going to cut anything. We're going to keep government uh, wh where it is. And so this $20 million, because we don't have the full budget yet, this $20 million has sort of become the proxy fight uh, for the big budget battle that's yet to come. It's sort of the, the one thing that we've got sitting out there right now that everybody can fight over. Uh, before we get to the big budget battle that will that will start next week with the with the full budget rolling out, let me say one thing though. One additional thing, I think there's one additional insight that's coming from this twenty million dollars. Okay. The the governor the governor's not is not saying education can spend less. It has to spend twenty million dollars less. What he's saying is the state government isn't is going to cut back its support to the local school districts. Uh, by uh, by twenty million dollars. There's nothing that says that the school districts themselves can't go out in their localities um, and and deal with this by uh, uh, spending cuts or revenue enhancements uh, in the localities to pay for their own schools. I think that's another piece of foreshadowing uh, what's going to come what's going to come with this budget. Basically, what state government is saying is we're pulling out of these uh, we're going to pull out of a lot of these areas. We're going to reduce funding in a lot of these areas uh, that, that support local government. And, and, and if I were the governor, and, and if I were you know, in state government, I would be saying, look, there's nothing that prevents you. If you think these are important in your localities, if you think these services are important in your localities, if you think maintaining you know, however many schools we've got on Prince of Wales Island, uh, however many school districts we've got, if you think that's important to your locality, go for it. You know, raise money locally. Um, uh, to, to do it. But as a state government, we can't afford to do that anymore. And I think there's going to be a lot of devolution, if you will, uh, from uh, uh, the, sort of the subtext of this is there's devolution from state government down to the localities and, and saying to the localities, if you th think these things are important, then go do it. What that's going to do is force the localities, the local governments, to face up to, to making choices themselves. And I think we're going to find in a lot of situations, the governments are going to say, hey, we don't want to fund that. Our citizens don't want to fund that. It was great when it was free money from the state uh, to be able to do these things. But but we have to pay for it ourselves. Oh, hell, heck no, we don't want to do these things. Right. And 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 I think that's a big benefit of the of the approach that the, that the Dunleavy administration is going to take. And, and I think that's another thing then that's being foreshadowed by this school budget cut. It's essentially saying, look. We're not going to fund this from the state level. We can't afford to fund it from the state level, but there's nothing that prevents you from funding it from the from the from the local level. If you want to give these high contracts, school bus contracts, other things, to uh, to your people in the locality, pay for it yourselves. But we're not going to pay for it. Brad Keith Lee is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're down to the last uh, well, less than sixty seconds here. Brad, your final closing thoughts here as we wrap things up for this hour. Uh, this session is going to be a wild one. We're going to go long. A lot of things on the table, but as we go through it, we got to make through. We got to make sure we're doing things right. Uh, the constitutional amendments. We've got to. We've got to. Uh, we've got to word those in a way that actually achieves the objectives. We've got to think about these things as we go through. We can't have knee jerks from either from either person. Harold said something which I remembered, and and although I agree that this might be the way that they're trying to push it. Um, the education formula on the local side, they are capped at a certain point because the formula is equalized and they can only contribute up to a certain amount um, for their local communities. Um, do you think that they're going to try and offer some kind of fix to that component of it as well? Or, Well, not all communities contribute. Uh, to, up to up to that level, and then you've got the whole unorganized borough uh, situation where none of the, uh, to my knowledge, very little, if any, of the or unorganized boroughs uh, have contribute contributions into their school districts. So, yeah, that's going to affect some school districts that are already at the cap. For example, uh, Fairbanks and probably Anchorage 
uh, have have local contributions that reach the cap and, and aren't and aren't going to under current law at least aren't going to be able to supplement in. But that's not <laughs> the case with all with all school districts. And, just, and and even in those school districts that are capped out, it's it, there's there's still going to be local choice. Do we consolidate schools? For example, is in, in some of the Bush boroughs or some of the Bush school districts, right. we can solve day school districts. So, yeah, yeah, that will come into play to some degree, but it's not an, an overriding consideration. Right, right. I think it's probably, again, part of that process where Dunleavy is an insider in some of these things is probably, like you said, the warning shot, the shot across the bow. Hey, you guys are going to have to take care of some of this. He, of course, talked about consolidating certain things like, for example, um, you know, talked about consolidating health care and other things amongst the various school districts and finding some efficiencies. So I think we're going to see I think we're going to see some insight into the education system that is probably not going to go as well as some people who are educators or who thought he was going to be very much pro education in that regard are going to like when it's all said and done. Uh I have. I almost spit my coffee out. I'm not drinking coffee, but if I had been, I probably would have. Jesse says, the state is spending today the same amount per capita adjusted for inflation as it did pre-pipeline in 1976. Um, which, I mean, I'd really like to see the data on that because prior to the pipeline coming in, uh, coming into play and the oil revenue flowing into the state, mm, I, you know, cite your sources is kind of my reaction to that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't remember that. I don't remember uh, that being the equivalent for pre-pipeline days. There, the state is spending is down to spending um, uh, the equivalent of what it did during uh, some of the um, uh, well, some of the Tony Knowles era, some of the era that we had where we had low oil prices uh, before, um, and and we have uh, brought spending down uh, to those levels. But but that's sort of irrelevant to me. I mean. Right. What, what's relevant is is what can we afford to spend, not not what have we spent before, but what can we afford to spend now, and what are Alaskans willing to pay up uh, uh, to spend now, and then fitting government inside of that revenue. This is ultimately government's limited by revenue. It's not limited by what we want to spend or what we spent in the past or what we spent in the way past. It's limited by revenue, and 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 what we want to what we what we can afford to spend. And that's what we ought to be focusing on as opposed to, you know, uh, comparisons to, to well, long ago times. Yeah, absolutely. And before the pitchforks and torches come out again, again, Brad and I, you know, both of us, our number one objective here is, you know, number one on the list of things to do to fix government is to cut the spending. The only reason we're talking about things like how a flat tax is more beneficial than any other form of taxation is because this is the place that they're dragging us to kicking and screaming. Now, you can argue all you want that, well, we shouldn't just give in. The problem is they're having the conversation without us. If we are not there arguing these things, they are having the conversation without us. And this is how we got taxed over the last three years with the taking of our dividend. I mean, you can't just ignore the fact that this is where they're going. Yes, cuts have to be number one. We need to cut government back to the basics of public safety, education, infrastructure. Those should be the three things we focus on. We should fix any oil taxation problems, you know, maximize the return to the state. We should do that. All those things should be done before we go back to the people for revenue. Am I wrong, Brad? No, no. Absolutely, absolutely right, Michael. But we have to face up to the fact that we've been at this seven years. You and I have been talking about this for seven years. I've been talking about it since 2012. We have to face up to the fact the legislature hasn't done it, and there are significant forces in the legislature that don't want to do it again. And we've run through $20 billion, $20 billion in fiscal reserves. We're out of savings. We're out of the uh, statutory budget reserve. We're damn near out of the constitutional budget reserve. We're out, of, we're out of savings. So if we can't get spending cut, we have to face that reality. And and how are we going to fund government? We can't keep going in the hole. Going in the hole means spending from the earnings reserve account, and it means effectively a tax on future Alaskans by cutting future PFDs. We have to face up to this. So yes, spending Cutting spending is is the primary objective, but if we don't get that done, it's time that we that we grow up and we face up to the fact that we're going to have to have additional revenue and have the debate about what source of additional revenue is the best. Brad Keithley, 
uh, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. Um, all right, Brad, less than a minute here. When we're co- when we come down to it, we're watching what's going on. Your prediction for the majority for all this other stuff. I mean, now we're talking about this Montana Big Sky plan with the fifty fifty split and all this other kind of BS. What are your thoughts on that? Quickly before we wrap up. Cut to the chase. We're going to get to the end of the legislature. The legislature is not going to make the spending cuts. They're going to send it to the governor with high spending. The governor and the, and the legislature is not going to fully fund the PFD because they're going to hold that back as a bargaining chip. The governor is going to say, I'm going to come in with line item vetoes. The legislature is going to say, we're going to fund part of that with PFD, uh, with, with, uh, with PFD. We're going to withhold the PFD then. Um, and we're going to, that's where we're going to be on or about June 30th. Uh, with those with those two pieces. Where it goes from there, I don't know. But uh, that's where we're heading. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thanks so much for coming on board today. Really appreciate it. Michael, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.